So I'm going to have to add some filler into those corners there. Oh, these ones have come off a lot tighter. Nice. So I'm going to have a go at making the uh, venting section that's on the side there. When this thing was originally made, it's pretty clear that they've worked off inches rather than centimetres. Uh, you can sort of tell that by there, there tends to be full measurements in inches or full increments as far as inches are concerned. Whereas um, the millimetre measurements go down to the like 0.3 of a millimetre and stuff like that. So some of it I've got to eyeball to a certain degree. Some other stuff does still fall within those same standards. I've been at, I've been able to find some inch and a half pipe, for instance, which goes down the side of that piece. There's two of those, it goes in there like that. But for the most part, trying to find off the shelf sort of sizes has been tricky. I can go close with different bits and pieces. I went out to the local recycle center and got a whole heap of bits and pieces. And a lot of it's sort of close, but I'd have to trim it down the side and shrink it in. And while I can do that with this stuff, I do have a thinner version of this board that I think will sort of lend itself to doing a bend that will make up some of the cylinder pieces that I need. Uh, there's a large cylinder piece that runs down the center and then there's this filter that goes on the side of the cyclotron and then there's another cylinder piece that goes up the top there as well. So I'm just going to have a crack at doing that and see what we come up with. So basically what I'm going to be doing is using the smaller pipe as a generalized guide and then stretching it back out to get the actual diameter that I need. Trim that bit off so that I can continue that bend. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. I've got to maintain that bend, but I've got to go over this section. I don't want to bump against this piece because that'll create a fold rather than a curve. So I need to oversize it and then shrink it back once I'm getting close to the right shape. That's getting pretty close. That's very nearly the right size that way. And it's gonna be significantly oversized that way. I need to get just a little bit more there to be able to marry up that edge. Okay. That should give me more than enough to be able to shrink it down to the right size. So now I can trim that one off as well. So now I can start reducing that, bringing those bits together, trimming it down a little bit more, and then reduce it again, bring it down a little bit more, trim it off again as I get closer and closer to that outside diameter. You can see there now how that's closed over. Now I can trim that off and reduce that side in and just repeat until I get the right side. getting pretty close one more should get me there so now that I'm 90% there to make sure I get this perfectly round I'm going to use some tape to clamp that shut and then I can make sure that the ends are squared off properly and then I can just use the mandrel piece to finish rounding off the shape So with a bit of perseverance, you can see that I can get that quite round. Uh, the other thing that I'm doing is because this is an undersized pipe, I'm angling the piece as best I can, which sort of broadens the amount of curve that I'm striking against. There we go, I think that's actually come out pretty good. I'll do a join on the inside to strengthen up the seam line. And when that's put in place, I'll pretty much just hide the seam in relation to the assembly of it. As good as these plans are, I'm not following them exactly to the T, mostly because in some instances I just can't because the way that I'm doing this with the cut and fold method, there's a little bit of size variance that invariably sort of creeps in. And as a result, it becomes more important for the parts to actually fit together correctly and look right rather than necessarily match an exact measurement. So I'm still definitely using this as a guide to make sure that I'm not drifting off by crazy numbers. But in some instances, it looks like there's gonna be a, between a two to five millimeter discrepancy in some parts. But I'm happy to wear that given that this is one of those sort of projects that the, uh, the thing is greater than the sum of its parts anyway. So a few of these cylindrical pieces that I have have to be attached to a flat piece. 
and I don't have an aluminium welder and the super glue is certainly not going to be good enough to do the job in this instance. So what I'm going to do is make up some press fit pieces to go into this that will allow me to bolt into it through the plate piece. I've made up one there already and I know you guys have seen me do this sort of thing in the past but I thought I'd describe exactly how it is that I'm doing it. I've started by cutting off a small piece of the same tube to give me a size guide. From there I'm just using the sharp tip of a file just to act as a scribe to go around the inside that pretty much gives me the line that I've got to cut up to to produce the piece. A quick trick to make it a little easier to see, any sort of lead pencil or a bit of graphite dust, um, if you sort of get that powder and basically rub it in, it'll be a lot easier to see that scribe line when you're trying to cut it out. I'm not sure that the camera's picking up that line there, but pretty much what I've done is just squared it off on the bandsaw and then knocked off the corners as close as I dare to that line. From there, I need to round that off as close as I can possibly get to the line, but not really cross it. It's just right up to the edge, but not going past it. That's the beveling done on that piece. As you can see, it doesn't need to be a lot. If it's enough that it starts gripping the edge like that, it's probably good enough to start the press. If you've got a press, that's great, but if you don't, you can do it with a hammer. Just be cautious in the way that you're doing it. You just want to go around the outside edge, hammering it gently. And then once it starts to settle, you can flip it over and increase the hammer blows on the other side. The other thing you want to make sure that you've done is that there's no burring left on the inside of the pipe. Once I've got that seated down a bit, I can switch out to a heavy hammer and go to town on it a bit more. The final thing to remember is that both ends from the impact will have a tendency to flare out a little bit and because you're relying on the elastic tension of the metal itself to hold everything in place, you might want to go around and hammer that edge down a little bit just before you finish it off. That's pretty much it done and ready for clean up. The other end, same sort of story, make sure you leave yourself at least a couple of mils so that you can trim that off as far as length is concerned. And that's it once it's cleaned up. And for all intensive purposes, you've pretty much got a seamless join that would be pretty close to as strong as what a weld would be for that sort of thickness anyway. For the opposite end, I am going to be using the composite material. The principle in making these is essentially the same thing, just the tolerances are a little bit less. Comparatively speaking, I make these ones so that I can pretty much almost push them in with my fingers. And whilst it's unlikely to be needed, I will be adding a little bit of super glue to the inside there just to make sure that it doesn't fall out. So because I didn't want this series to turn into uh, tune in to watch Jazz build another box series, uh, I've gone ahead and sort of sped through everything and made up the bulk of the components already. Uh, the one that I haven't got at the moment is the top for the cyclotron section uh, and one box where the gun or the wand mounts onto the side. Apart from that, I've pretty much got most of the parts I need sorted out. And once I've got those two final components sorted, I can start marrying all these parts together into one solid piece and then start working out what I need to do to populate the surface with the necessary cables and connections and all that sort of thing. Uh, I still have to make up some top caps for those two pieces and as I said pull all the joinery together, uh, work out a mounting plate for those two to go together so that it mounts onto the bottom of that one. Most of what I've been doing has been really quite repetitive. Uh, the only one that had any major degree of complexity is the crank box type one where there's been a, a number of different angles and stuff that I needed to work out. But as I said, for the most part, it's really just been a matter of working out that box arrangement and folding in the pieces into place as you've seen in previous videos. And I'll go over the individual parts with you in more detail once I've got to the point where I'm ready to assemble them all together. But all in all, it's coming together quite quickly now and I'm pretty happy with it so far. So anyway, guys, that'll be the update for this time. Thanks for watching. Talk to you next time.